So I was thinking for this week's video, I was going to post a video just talking about fostering in general. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good obviously being how incredible kittens are. The ugly being how messy <laughs> they can get. And then I got to the bad and I wanted to talk about something kind of sad and that's losing a kitten. So I got to that part of the video that I was editing and I realized I feel like I should make a video just about the kitten that I've lost. Um, just kind of to honor him before I just casually mention it in this other video that I'm working on. So I just wanted to tell you guys the story of Gus Gus. A lot of you found me through this video. Lady was the first cat that we had ever fostered and she gave birth here in our house under our dining table <laughs> and it was incredible to watch and watching her become a mom and watching her kittens grow and thrive was absolutely incredible. Sadly, one of her kittens didn't make it and um, I didn't want to include that in the videos that I had already put out because we wanted to remember him in, in all the ways that he was so funny and silly and cute and we didn't want to kind of like talk about the fact that we did eventually lose him in those videos. So Gus Gus, um, he was one of the three like light striped ones. We had two that looked identical, and that was Maple and McFurry, and then two other ones that looked identical, and that was Petra and Maximilian. And Gus Gus, he was different. He just kind of looked a little bit like Maximilian and Petra, but he had his own flair. He was kind of like striped in a way. He had really like nice stripes on his face. So everything seemed perfectly normal. Lady gave birth to beautiful, beautiful, healthy looking kittens and she raised them, she accepted all of them. Sometimes when there's a runt in the litter, the mom would maybe like not accept it. The reason that happens in nature, the reason sometimes moms will just neglect the runt is because they want to, they don't think that it has a high chance of survival, so they wanna save their resources for the ones that are actually have a better chance of survival. So in the very beginning when they were born, all five of them weighed Similarly, um, they all had healthy weights and she accepted all of them. So there wasn't really a runt. So everything looked fine. Everybody was great. Everybody was happy. And then one day, I want to say when he was four weeks old, when they were all four weeks old, all the kittens were playing and Gus Gus was sleeping. And that's fine because, you know, kittens sleep a lot. That wasn't really cause for concern at that point. But we noticed that all the kittens were playing and Gus Gus was sleeping. And then... Eventually all the kittens tired themselves out and they all went to take a nap and then they woke up from the nap and everybody was playing again and Gus Gus was still sleeping. So that was kind of our first red flag where we were like, okay, that's weird. Something's wrong. Two days prior, Petra was sick. So Petra, two days prior, was throwing up a little bit. The foster kittens within our care, if they get sick during our shelter's normal hours, we just need to take them to the shelter so that their in-house vet can take a look. But if they get sick outside of the shelter hours, we need to take them to an emergency hospital, uh, emergency like vet hospital. So um, just a couple days prior to this, Petra was sick. It was after hours. So I sent a video to the coordinator of Petra's you know, symptoms. She was meowing really loudly. She was, I think she had a stomach ache. And the coordinator said, just take her to the vet just in case. And we ended up taking Petra to the vet just in case. And because she was still so young and nursing, we actually had to take mom and the whole crew because we couldn't separate mom from any of her babies because we didn't know how long we were going to be. We ended up packing up the whole crew and going to the emergency vet. And then this was during prime time pandemic. And so we weren't allowed to go inside. So we actually had to just stay in the car. And the nurse came out and took Petra, took her in, and they you know, ran some tests. And then they just brought her back out to us. And that time, we just kind of hung out in the car. We, we let Lady out of her carrier. And she kind of got to like walk around inside of the car. And it was nighttime. And she was kind of like, cool. It, it was a cool experience for her, I think. She got to explore. So that was that. And we ended up going home. Like, here's her medication she should be good. So again, fast forward to two days later, Gus Gus seems like he's not feeling well. So I thought, okay, maybe he has the same thing that Petra had. I didn't really think too much of it. So I texted the coordinator and I said, hey, it's me again. <laughs> Gus Gus seems like he's not himself. He seems kind of lethargic. And so she asked me for a video. At that point, I had taken Gus Gus out of his nest. He was sleeping in, in their nest. 
and I took him out because I just figured, well, if he's sleeping anyway, let me let him sleep on my chest because kins like warmth and you know, they like our body warmth. And so I was just laying on the couch while, the, while his siblings were all playing and I just had him on my chest. He was like kind of like sleeping on my chest and he, he didn't seem like he wanted to get up or go. He just wanted to stay put. So she, the coordinator wanted a video. So I took him off my chest and I put him on the floor so that we can, you know, so I can basically wake him up, see if he'll play. And he didn't want to play. He kind of just like stood there. And then I noticed he was shivering a little bit. So I sent a video of him shivering. And as it was sending, I saw him trying to like to walk, but he wasn't really walking in a straight line. So I sent a follow up video and the coordinator replied as soon as she saw the video of him shivering. And she was like, yeah, take, take him to the vet. Something seems wrong. Again, this was after hours. So we packed up at this point. It was just us and Gus. Uh, she told us we could just take him. I think maybe she might have known that something was like really wrong. So immediately when she said that, within seconds we were at the door. And because he couldn't really walk much, I didn't put him in the carrier. I just held him. We took a little blanket and we had him in the blanket and we got into the car and my husband was driving and I just was holding Gus Gus the whole time. And he kind of like woke up a little bit while we were in the car. So I felt like, oh, he's coming around. This is good. Um, he woke up and he kind of was like looking. It was golden hour. The sun was beautiful. And, you know, it was like spring. Nature was beautiful. The greenery was, you know, trees everywhere. And, and Gus Gus was kind of just like looking out the window and looking at everything. And, and um, he kind of like woke up a little bit. I had him up here so he could, he could see. He had a good... Um, he had a good like line of sight to the outside world. It was a 20 minute car ride. And after we arrived, the nurse came outside to meet us. I got up, got left the car with Gus on me with his blanket and I gave her him to her. And I just updated her. I was like, yeah, you know, it seems he has a fever because he's shivering. Um, and he wasn't really walking straight, but he was, she was like, was he good before that? I was like, yeah, he was literally perfect. He was like running around like a day ago. Um, so she was like, okay, like, cool, we'll let you know. So she goes in with him and I go out to the car <clears throat> and I just, my husband and I are just waiting at this point in the car. So 30 minutes later, we get a call and it's the, the nurse and she says, hey, so yeah, he, he definitely had a high fever or he definitely has a high fever. Um, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. He has a fever. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And I'm thinking she's going to give us like a, I don't know, a fever reducer or something. So she's like, yeah, so I think the the most humane thing to do would be to let him go. And I was like, huh? <laughs> like, what? And I I was kind of like, my heart sank at that moment, but my my mind was still really confused. So I put on a speaker so my husband could hear this. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm sorry, what do you mean? And she was like, yeah, I'm sorry. Like, you know, we, we did what we could do, but unfortunately there's nothing we can do at this point. His fever was too high and we, uh, the, the best thing for him would be to let him go. So I'm like, again, like I, I felt like I got whiplash. Like he was literally perfectly fine, perfectly healthy. He was running around and playing with his siblings and all of them were growing, you know, their, their weights were perfect. I was monitoring their weights and it, it just didn't make sense. And I was thinking, did he catch something? Like what, what, how, how did he even get sick? Like what is going on? So um, I, I started telling her like, is, is there anything you can do? Like, is there any kind of like, anything? Can you try anything? And she was like, well, there's like some kind of treatment or procedure. She said something, something $5,000. And I was like, okay, can you, can you try it? And she was like, well, the shelter can't afford a $5,000 like treatment. You know, they, they, they can't. So, oh my God, my leg fell asleep. Ugh, it's like pins and needles. So she said, um, the shelter can't afford that. And I said, okay, well, I'll pay half of it. <laughs> now I clearly didn't have like $2,500 to spare but like at that point I just wasn't even thinking straight but and I was like okay I don't care I'll go get take out a loan like I'll pay half of it can the shelter cover the other half if I pay half if I pay half of it so the nurse was like really nice and I think at that point she realized that I was kind of like spiraling and even though I mean I, I kept my cool on the phone but I was like not accepting what she was saying um and so she was like you know what let me call the shelter coordinator and like talk to her and I'll have her like she can talk to you like you, you guys can figure it out so I was like okay that sounds good so we get a call back from the shelter coordinator and she's like hey um 
you know, I just talked to the nurse and the vet, and it seems like there's kind of like no coming back from this for Gus Gus. Apparently, his um, fever was too high. Um, it was so high that it caused like brain damage, and that's why he was unable to walk. And um, she was saying the procedure or treatment, again, I don't really remember specifically what it was, but she was like, that thing, there's no po like real positive outcome of that because he, like, he, pro he either won't make it still, like still won't make it after that, or like his quality of life would be really, really low because of, again, how much damage like he took because he's so small and he had to try fever, doesn't really have a chance. And I was like, okay, well, can we at least take him home so that he can pass away, like, at home, like, with us, like, taking care of him? And she was like, he would be more at peace if we just let him go now because he's, he's obviously very sick. Like, he's not having a good time. He's not at peace. He's not relaxed. He's struggling. And the, sorry, my phone's ringing. And um, the best thing we can do for him is to let him go. So I said, okay. And, um hung up and we just started crying and the next few days mama and the kittens like I don't I don't really I don't know if they noticed or not but they didn't seem any different they the kittens were still playing mama did have a habit of kind of like looking around the house maybe like trying to find toys or something she did do that and a part of me did wonder like is she looking for him but um, she was fine other than that. She didn't, she didn't display any signs of, you know, grieving or anything like that. Over the next few days, it was, it was really sad. I cried a lot. We cried and it was just so sad. It's like, obviously, so there's so much sorrow in the world. And there is sad stuff happening all the time to animals and to humans and to children. And, and it's all so sad. And it's just like, I don't know, something about like seeing it happen to to a kitten who's like so innocent and I started thinking back to to basically what happened what it was that got him sick and the coordinator was talking to me and she was saying that most likely he was born with some kind of something that like this was bound to happen apparently the mortality rate for kittens is really high before they reach a certain age but it was it was a shock for sure so um they were saying that he's probably born with something and then I remembered something that happened when he was young one night when he was about a week and a half old or something, before they could even get out of their nest, my husband and I were sleeping, but we usually shut the door so that the cats can't um, get into the room because we don't want them to get used to sleeping with us and then getting really sad when we have to separate inevitably. So we had just gone to bed and we hear this like, and I'm like, like what is that and then we hear another meow and mind you when kittens are like a week and a half old their meows don't even sound like meows they sound like ah. <laughs> I don't know they're cute but they're like definitely not something you expect to hear when you're not expecting it and then we hear it again and it turns out lady took Gus Gus out of the nest and came and put him like hid him somewhere else and put him under our bed like underneath not like under the covers no like under the bed and so we literally got up and we were like tracing the sound and we had to lift up the mattress to see because we were like there was no way like and it was just right there I wish I had a picture it was the funniest thing he was just right there in between the slits of the bed frame and he's just right there and he's like Meow. and I'm just like oh my god like what are you doing here so picked him up and took him back to the nest and at that point we had a good laugh about it and we were like maybe she was trying to change her nest location so we chalked it up to like okay she just wanted to switch locations so that that happened when he was a week and a half old and after he passed I was doing a lot of reading about kitten mortality and stuff it was saying that sometimes if a kitten is born with some kind of abnormality moms know that and so they will take them and they will separate them from the rest of the litter the mom can sense when a kitten is unwell and she decided at that point to separate him from the rest of them so that um yeah, so that she keeps the rest of them have a higher chance of survival. I think losing a pet is like one of the hardest things somebody can go through. Obviously not to take away from all the other really hard things going on in the world because there's definitely harder stuff going on in the world. But also just losing a pet I feel like is one of the only optional things that we put ourselves through because when we adopt a pet, 
we're signing ourselves up to go through like the heartbreak of a lifetime and 12 years time or so. It's funny because I was thinking fostering is a way to get around that because I, I love animals so much, but I don't want to go through losing a pet. Right before we started fostering, my husband lost his dog who, you know, he had like raised from puppyhood and loved for, for so many years. There's a helicopter flying overhead. <laughs> So yeah, so my husband had lost his dog right before we started fostering and it was absolutely soul crushing to see him go through that. So I always thought like fostering is great because you get your fill, you get to love all these animals and take care of all these animals and then you send them off to homes where they can be happy, you know, happily living ever after, where they can live happily ever after and you don't ever have to like lose them. So yeah, it was just really ironic. It was, you know, kind of like a reminder that there are certain things that you just can't predict. Sorry for rambling. Whew. <laughs> yeah, so I can clearly like talk about this now, but it did make me think for just a moment when I was like, you know, when it first happened, I was thinking, I don't think I'm cut out for fostering because I'm too emotional. <laughs> like, I, I don't think I can open myself up to this kind of thing to happen again. But then I honestly quickly got over that thought and I was like, no, I'm so happy that I gave him such a comfortable home and place to be because if I wasn't fostering him and he was at the shelter, he would have probably still had just as much time of life, but it would have looked very different. So yeah, even though it's hard on the caregiver, I think it's worth it as long as we know we're giving them a high quality of life while, while, they, while they're here. And I guess just thinking back, I'm really happy that we didn't put him in a in a carrier in the car ride to the vet because I think he had a very, you know, beautiful car ride. He had very beautiful final moments, I think, when he was just able to like watch the sunset while we were driving. And I guess there's like nothing, there comes a point where there's nothing you can do. We still had Lady and four kittens at the house and they stayed with us for way longer. I mean, this happened at week four. The kittens stayed with us until like week eight or nine. So at least double that time. A few weeks later, I had to actually go back into the shelter to pick up some supplies and the, the coordinator came out and gave me this really special plaque that I'll put right here. That, that was really, really sweet. I really appreciated that. So yeah, um, that's the story of Gus Gus. He was an adorable, adorable baby, and we had him for a wonderful, wonderful four weeks. And he was one of my first fosters ever. All the fosters we've had have come and gone, but he's the only foster we've had that never like went to another home. So I feel like in a way I feel really close to him because we're all the family he's ever known. That's Gus Gus's story. I am gonna just briefly touch on this in my next video when I talk about all the sides of fostering, but I just wanted to make sure I told you guys about it because I know a lot of you loved that litter. This is actually the first video I'm recording for you in real time since creating this channel. All the other videos you've seen up until now have actually been recorded about like a year or two ago. We typically get kittens in between late February to fall because cats give birth when it's warm enough for the kittens to survive outside. So since I live somewhere that does experience pretty cold and harsh winters, cats aren't usually giving birth around here in these months. So it's been kind of slow, kind of quiet over here with no kittens. So yeah, that gives me a chance to just go through and introduce you guys to everybody that I've fostered the past two years. And then hopefully now when I get my first fosters of this year, I'll get to actually take you along like in real time. So I just want to say thank you so much for uh, being here. Thank you everybody for subscribing and for your sweet words. And I, I read every single comment and you're all so, so nice. So thank you for caring about kittens and thank you for, for being here.